This is a Fox San Antonio special. takes about 100 million years to form. The sun and the rest of the solar system formed from a giant rotating cloud of gas and dust called a solar nebula about 4.5 billion years ago. The sun is made primarily of the lightest element in the universe. It's about three quarters hydrogen. The other quarter of that is the second lightest element in the universe, helium. Because it's hydrogen and helium, it's gaseous, it's not solid. And as you go deeper all the way to the interior, we get to the core of the sun, and that's where something very special takes place. It's in the very core of the sun, the pressure is so high that it, uh, it, it takes four hydrogen atoms and fuses them into helium. There's a loss of mass when you do this fusion process, and, uh, and, and that loss of mass goes into energy is in order to produce that much energy, the sun is losing four million tons of weight every single second of its life. And that's what powers the sun. That's why we see the sun shining as brightly as we do. The sun is literally blowing a large part of itself away each second as it shines brightly in the sky. The sun is 432,168.6 miles across it would take more than 300,000 Earths to equal its mass. It would take 1.3 million Earths to fill it up. While it is huge compared to the Earth, it is really just a medium-sized star. The sun has six regions, the core, the radiative zone, and the convective zone. The visible surface, called the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the outermost region called the corona. At the core, the temperature is about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to continue thermonuclear fusion. The sun is just basically a battle between gravity uh, and energy uh, inside. Gravity wants to compress the, uh, the sun, but the uh, heat and the energy being generated in its core keeps it expanded out. Energy from the core is carried outward by radiation, which bounces around the radiative zone, taking about 170,000 years to get from the core to the top of the convective zone. Here, large bubbles of hot plasma move upward within the zone. The surface of the sun, the part that we can see, is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's much cooler than the blazing core, but it's still hot enough to make carbon, like diamonds and graphite, not just melt, but boil. Above the photosphere are the chromosphere and the corona, which make up the thin solar atmosphere. This is where we see features such as sunspots and solar flares. The temperature in the sun's atmosphere reaches as high as 3.5 billion degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is made primarily of the lightest element in the universe. It's about three quarters hydrogen. The other quarter of that is the second lightest element in the universe, helium. Because it's hydrogen and helium, it's gaseous, it's not solid. The sun actually rotates and spins about once every 25 days at its equator. But at its poles, it actually takes a little longer, 36 days. Because it rotates faster at the equator than it does at the poles, it's got a magnetic field that starts getting twisted up. And magnetic fields don't like to twist. And so what the sun does to compensate is it creates some miniature magnetic fields on its surface uh, to help prevent that twisting at various locations. And those miniature magnetic fields 
kind of cool the uh, immediate surface area and we see those as sunspots. In addition to heat and light, the sun also emits a low density stream of charged particles known as the solar wind. The solar wind and the much higher energy particles ejected by solar flares can have damaging effects on the Earth. Scientists predict that the sun is a little less than halfway through its lifetime and will last another 6.5 billion years. At that point, it will run out of hydrogen and will no longer be able to hold back the crushing pressure of gravity. And so uh, gravity will, will start compressing the sun ultimately to end up in a, as a white dwarf. When we come back, a look at the dark side of the sun's power. Ninety-three million miles away, the sun is our nearest star. Traveling at the speed of light, sunlight travels the distance in about eight minutes. The sun's light energy is driven by thermonuclear reactions deep within its core. Energy is heat, it takes millions of years, but that heat uh, basically propagates out to the surface. The sun is literally exploding. It would take 100 billion tons of dynamite exploding every second to equal the energy produced by the sun. The only thing holding our star together is gravity. The sun is just basically a battle between gravity uh, and energy uh, inside. Gravity wants to compress the, uh, the sun, but the uh, heat and the energy being generated in its core keeps it expanded out. For centuries, civilizations have studied, tracked, and even worshipped the sun. Ra was known as the sun god and the creator in Egypt. The Greeks had Helios, the sun god, while the Romans had Sol Invictus. It was Nikolai Copernicus who was among the first to claim in 1543 that the sun was at the center of the solar system. Galileo, who risked blindness by looking at the sun through a telescope, claimed that there were spots on its surface in 1610, a discovery that came as a great surprise and one that cost Galileo his freedom. It was not long before Christopher Snyder, a priest, invented a safe way to view sunspots by projecting the sun's image on a screen. Everyone was talking about sunspots. Then something strange happened. These amazing dark spots on the sun suddenly disappeared. They would mysteriously return 70 years later. So originally back in, uh, in even 1930, uh, it was not understood uh, that the solar wind was continuous. Astronomers of the time had an idea that charged particles were coming off the sun, but they thought it was an off and on thing. It wasn't until the 1950s, uh, looking at actually tails of comets, that they were able to show that, no, there is a solar wind out there and it is continuous. A guy by the name of Gene Parker uh, uh, figured out how the solar wind could, could be produced. In 1962, uh, a young researcher, Marcia Neugebauer, uh, built the first instrument uh, and measured the solar wind. The average solar wind moves about 894,775 miles per hour, or about the distance it would take to travel across the Earth four times in just one minute. We're trying to understand uh, what drives solar activity. The thing we'd like to understand is uh, what, uh, how, do, how do solar flares and what we call coronal mass ejections, how do they uh, come about? The sun is a really dynamic object and it's got a magnetic field that does a lot of twisting and that twisting magnetic field causes all kinds of phenomena. For centuries, early astronomers wondered whether there were clouds floating in the sun's atmosphere. Today, we know they're really large areas with intense magnetic fields that slow down the flow of heat, creating sunspots and magnetic eruptions. It's, it's a very complicated thing. Think about a burp of plasma of these particles coming through and they stream towards the Earth. It's like snapping a rubber band. It puts energy into the particles. The particles go out into space. Some of that makes it into our protective bubble. Um, it causes a process called magnetic reconnection. And when you have 
uh, a large, for example, a large magnetic storm happen around the Earth, um, we may see a beautiful aurora, we may see something that uh, on Earth is, you know, beautiful, but it also has real impacts. Sunspots are the main sources for solar flares and coronal mass ejections. The highly charged plasma blasts orbiting spacecraft, creating glitches in the operating systems. One back in the late 1960s, actually, uh, when it interacted with Earth's magnetic field, uh, totally disrupted the power grid in the Northeast and caused a, caused a blackout in the Northeastern United States. Scientists have discovered there is an 11-year cycle for sunspots. It's like a uh, hurricane season. There may be a prediction for a small, uh, 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 not a particularly active season, but you can be surprised by those big storms that come through. Trying to understand the sun, it's kind of like shooting at a moving target here uh, because it's changing uh, before our very eyes, uh, it just in the uh, history of the space age. We have uh, both uh, satellites in orbit around the sun, uh, as well as satellites and ground telescopes here on Earth that are constantly watching uh, the sun's behavior. We also have missions that are looking and measuring the particles coming from the sun. We're trying to understand uh, what drives solar activity. Sunspots are the main sources for solar flares and intense bursts of magnetic plasma called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. These solar magnetic storms can damage satellites, overheat and cripple our power grids, and much more. Scientists want to understand exactly what causes these powerful explosions and someday be able to predict them even before they erupt. A new space probe is promising to give us the answers about solar physics that scientists have puzzled over for decades. When we come back, our first attempt to reach out and touch the sun. The sun is the largest object in our solar system, containing 99.8% of the solar system's mass. The sun is one of more than 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. It orbits some 25,000 light years from the galactic core, completing a revolution once every 230 million years. Sunspots caused by intense magnetic fields are launching pads for coronal mass ejections and happen during active times for the sun. It's this 11 year cycle. 2011 was our last solar maximum. There's something called solar max when the sun is most active and solar min. So we're kind of approaching our solar minimum cycle right now. The earliest civilizations all looked to the sun as something powerful and perfect. Many built structures to help them study it, like Stonehenge and the 5,000-year-old Majorville Medicine Wheel in Canada. In 1610, Galileo stunned the people of Europe when he claimed to see spots on a perfect sun. That discovery cost him his freedom. Today, we're actively studying the sun. We have a lot of assets. NASA has a lot of assets that are always looking, watching. We also have missions that are looking and measuring the particles coming from the sun. There are currently 20 missions to study the sun. A fleet of solar, heliospheric, geospace, and planetary spacecraft work together to form a single unit called the Heliophysics Systems Observatory. Basically every three minutes we get a measurement of the, of the uh, solar wind velocity and density. It's traveling very fast. It's uh, traveling at uh, what we call the slow solar wind. It's not very slow, it's 400 kilometers a second. The sun's output is not entirely constant, nor is the amount of sunspot activity. There was a period of very low sunspot activity in the latter half of the 17th century called the Maunder Minimum. It lines up perfectly with an abnormally cold period in Northern Europe, sometimes known as the Little Ice Age. Since the formation of the solar system, the sun's output has increased about 40%. Trying to predict when sunspots will come and when coronal mass ejections will happen is not easy. It's like a uh, hurricane season. There may be a prediction for a small, uh, 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 not a particularly active season, but you can be surprised by those big storms that come through. There is a new and exciting mission to study the sun and it has San Antonio connections. Southwest Research Institute is leading the systems engineering and management of several of the probe's components. 
This is a fascinating mission. We're going to be getting closer to the sun than anyone has ever been for. NASA's Parker probe will be the first ever mission to touch the sun. The spacecraft, about the size of a small car, will get as close as four million miles from the surface of the sun. It will be directly in the sun's atmosphere where the spacecraft and its instruments will encounter temperatures in the millions of degrees. It actually is a fairly long mission, but it's, we've got to be very clever how to do it. It's an incredible engineering problem just to get that close and survive. There is an enormous heat shield. All the instruments are living behind this big carbon shield. It's anything that pokes out would not last long. The Parker probe will gather data that will help answer questions about the solar wind that scientists have wondered about for over 60 years. A lot of what happens by the time the solar wind gets to us at Earth has been frozen in. All the heating, all the dynamics are happening very close to the sun. If we look closer, we can actually see what's happening. There's a lot of questions about the sun that we just don't know. The Solar Dynamics Observatory, launched in 1995, has been collecting enough data about the sun each day to fill out eight DVDs every 36 seconds. The spacecraft has taken the mystery out of coronal mass ejections. We understand that they come about um, through a process called magnetic reconnection, where magnetic field lines annihilate and and reconnect. It's like snapping a rubber band. It puts energy into the particles. The particles go out into space and ultimately or can intersect the Earth and um, create what we call space weather. This is a real challenging problem, but there's some really smart people working on it. Trying to understand the sun, it's kind of like shooting at a moving target here uh, because it's changing uh, before our very eyes. Uh, it just in the uh, history of the space age. The universe is full of plasma and it's full of magnetic fields and all over the place in the universe you have one plasma colliding with another. An example of that is the solar wind coming in and colliding with Earth's magnetosphere. And then the magnetic energy in the plasma, some fraction of that magnetic energy is converted very rapidly into plasma energy. So you can think of it as, as kind of like a magnetic explosion. The reason this is important is because uh, these explosions uh, drive a lot of the weather patterns that we see in the magnetosphere, and so what space scientists like to refer to as space weather. Um, and these space weather phenomena can have um, impact um, on our everyday lives. It can actually affect communication satellites, the power grid, so we'd really like to understand how these magnetic explosions work. When we come back, when the sun disappeared and the day turned to night. The sun regularly releases a constant stream of magnetic solar material called the solar wind, along with an occasional burst of solar material called coronal mass ejections. These features interact with the Earth's magnetic field. If we see a large flow of particles, a shock wave uh, coming through solar wind, we have about 40 minutes to an hour notice. These storms can affect our power grids, railway systems, orbiting satellites, and much more. We see these storms as the aurora at both poles. No doubt a frightening, if not eerie sight to early civilizations. Imagine what it must have been like to see the sun disappear from the sky. One of the earliest solar eclipses was recorded by Chinese historians. It was an epic occurrence. The sun blocked out for six minutes and 25 seconds. We know that the Chinese were able to predict eclipses with great regularity back uh, as far back as 1300 BC. And there is some evidence that the Egyptians and Babylonians were able to, uh, if not perfectly, make predictions. They were somewhat able to accurately predict most eclipses as far back as 2000, maybe even 2500 BC. While the Chinese, Babylonian, and Greek cultures ruled the astronomical knowledge of the Old World, they weren't the only ones tracking the skies. Far across the ocean to the west, the Mayan civilization had developed astronomical calendars and were recording observations of lunar eclipses in codices or folding books. 
There's a regular pattern of the moon. Um, it occurs roughly every 18 years. And so if you can start measuring that pattern and get that pattern down, it becomes a lot easier to make those predictions. The key element of an eclipse is the fact that the moon's orbit is about five degrees tilted. That little five degree tilt is very important. There are only two points during the year when the moon's orbit will cross the path of the sun. This path is called the ecliptic. Everything has to be in the right position at the right time for a solar eclipse to happen. Solar eclipses were the blockbuster events of the ancient world, turning day into night. These events were more feared than the lunar eclipse. There's some speculation um, about maybe what could be the most famous eclipse of all is uh, the biblical story of the crucifixion of Christ. We're told it's from the uh, sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is three hours, and so solar eclipses don't last that long. But we also know uh, historically that time was sort of exaggerated uh, in biblical stories. And there are two that occurred in that region almost right around the dates that we think his crucifixion would have been. There was one in 29 AD and there was one in 33 AD. 2,000 years later, Albert Einstein developed his theory of relativity. He believed that massive objects like the sun caused a distortion in space-time. That distortion is what we call gravity. Solar eclipses in 1919 and in 1920 gave astronomers of the time a chance to see if Einstein's theory was right. Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, a, a famous astronomer of the 1920s, measured exactly what Einstein predicted with this general theory of relativity about light bending around a big mass like the Sun. We happen to live at exactly the right time in geologic history where the moon is just the right distance from us that the moon looks almost exactly the same size on the sky as the sun. This creates a total solar eclipse and allows scientists to observe the sun's atmosphere from top to bottom. This solar eclipse coming in August is going to be probably the most spectacular one that we have had uh, certainly since 1991 and maybe since 1979. The path of totality, the path where this moon blocks the sun's light, the main body of the sun, comes in through Oregon, goes across the United States, and exits out of South Carolina. On August 21st, for the first time in nearly 100 years, the United States will see a coast-to-coast -coast total solar eclipse. The moon's shadow will make the trip in about two and a half hours. Scientists are super excited about the total solar eclipse. When the moon blocks the sun's light, we get to see the solar corona. But the actual totality is only gonna last a few minutes. We will see about 70% of the sun get blocked. If you're in a partial eclipse, which is all of North America, Central America, and even parts of South America, then what you'll see is the moon cross in front of the sun, but not block all of its light. We never want to look directly at the sun with the naked eye that can do extreme damage to your eye. Each square centimeter of the sun's surface shines with as much power as a 6,000 watt light bulb. So with a pinhole projector you can watch the moon go across the sun and take a bite out of the sun's light. In about seven years we get really lucky in San Antonio because there will be another total solar eclipse that bisects the city. This has been a Fox San Antonio special.